at the University of Twente, Netherlands. He performed postdoctoral studies at KU Leuven, Harvard, and MIT. Uh, he has raised more than eight million dollars, eight million euro in the last few years. Authored more than sixty-five peer-reviewed journal papers, including Nature Communications, Cell, Stem Cell, Advanced Material, Advanced Functional Materials, and PNAS, and received many. Uh, he received and valorized three patents. He has received numerous recognitions, including an ERC starting grant, the highly prestigious personal Veni and Vidi Award by the Dutch Research Council, was recognized twice by the popular science magazine New Scientist as top 10 North European young scientific talent, and was the recipient of the best engineering idea of 2018 by the Dutch Academy of Engineers, the Jean Leray Award of the European Society of Biomaterials, and the Robert Brown Award of the Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine International Society. The floor is yours, Fiora. Thank you, Mehmet, for the kind introduction. Um, also for the Tirsaki Institute to invite me to give this talk. And I hope you are all doing well and are COVID free, especially since we are going to start talking a little bit about things you should be able to taste. So my lab actually works quite a lot with uh, how to engineer heterogeneity or multi-skill materials. Specifically, what we like to do is to consider material properties and then create a hierarchy within that material in order to give it additional function. To make a simple analogy of why that is important is if you would consider these two cookies, they are exactly the same. They're composed of two components, chocolate and cookie. However, in one, you have a heterogeneous modular design, and in the other one, you have a homogeneous design. If you would put this in a very high-end blender and then put it in a mass, uh, mass spectrometer, it will tell you it's identical. Yet, I'm pretty sure you can agree with me that if you would actually bite into such a cookie, you would find that they actually taste really different. So our physiological experience is uh, involved with modularity. We are able to uh, taste and experience uh, hierarchical designs. And that's because these materials, for example, the chocolate, the chocolate and the cookie, these materials differ in a lot of their properties. Think about degradation, mechanical behavior, solubility, hydrophobicity, et cetera, et cetera. So what I and my teammates really like doing is incorporating such modularity in conventional constructs. Now, the reason why we like doing that is still the same as for such a cookie. If you would like to make a condiment uh, such as this, or you would like to take some flour, some egg, some salt or sugar, and some oil or butter, you make a homogeneous construct, you add your secret ingredients, and there you go. You have a product. In tissue engineering, we do pretty much the same, except that we use polymers, cells, matrix, growth factors. We create a homogeneous construct, think hydrogel. We add our secret ingredients, and there you go. It's our product. But if you actually look at natural tissues, natural tissues are never homogeneous. They're never made this way. It's not just a cell in just a polymer. And then the question is, does that matter? Can we work with that? And if we would break through this and would be able to incorporate modularity, is there a reason why to assume that this would improve its function? Now, we believe it does. And let me argue that a little bit more. If you take one of the uh, most simple tissues inside of our human body, for example, cartilage, if you look at the textbook, if you would open it for the bachelor students, it would say it's one of the simplest tissues. It's composed of one matrix type containing a single cell type. Now, if we take a, a histological section, you can see that why people would think that. If you take a high res um, uh, bright field microscope, you can see that that modularity is a little bit more complex than you would think. And if you even zoom in further, then you can truly see the modularity of the system. It's a cell within a pericellular matrix within an extracellular matrix. So it is really already modular in that design. There's hierarchy. Now, if you then analyze the material properties, for example, you would look at stiffness, then you could see that the cell is within a very soft domain in the orders of tens of kilopascal, while the extra uh, or distal extracellular matrix, it's in the orders of hundreds uh, of kilopascal, even ranging up to two megapascal. If you would put this cell, this chondrocyte, inside of such a stiff matrix directly, the cell would become, fibro uh, would become uh, fibrosis, so it would 
become fibrocartilage, it would dysfunction, and all the way around, if we would make the entire cartilage out of something so soft as this uh, territorial matrix, this pericellular matrix, then your joint would feel the first step you would take. So mechanically speaking, there's a strong reason why we would like to have such a modularity in our cartilage. Similarly, if we would look at, for example, where our growth factors located, these factors are specifically located around the cell. So these pericellular matrices or this modularity really matters for our natural tissues. If you remove it, it dysfunctions. So what we really try to do is to engineer this modularity. In order to create such a thing, we need to use engineering strategies. And how we do that in our lab is we use microfluidics. For those not intimately familiar with the concept, microfluidics is based on a chip design where you have channels in which you mix immiscible fluids. Think, for example, oil and uh, an aqueous phase. Basically, you're making a vinaigrette, only then you do it in a very controlled manner. So here's a polymer uh, coming through a channel in which is co-flown with oil, and then it pinches off in a very controlled manner. Now, you can do that with cells in your polymers as well, and what you then get is these kind of cell entrapped in a droplet that we then subsequently can cross-link. Now, this was done before we even started this. This is dec decades of years old, putting cells in tiny droplets. But the droplets that people were making back then were 100, 200, 300 micrometers uh, large. Very useful for single cell screening applications. But once you start to use it for uh, tissue engineering and you start to do the math, these conventional constructs state you will get something anywhere between 10,000 cells per cubic centimeter and up to 100,000 cells per cubic centimeter. So it's way below any of the design criteria. So in order to go into uh, the concentrations that we would need, think tens of millions of cells, we calculated that you would need a much smaller uh, single cell microgel, for example, think 35, 40 micrometers. Now, that matches with the cell size. So if you would characterize the cell size, you would see that it is basically at the high end spectrum of your average cell, whether it's a chondrocyte or an MSC. So if you take something of 35 uh, micrometer gel, most of these cells are encapsulated. It will fit. The reason why people hadn't made such a small construct and why they were relying on bigger construct is if you would take a polymer, for example, an enzymatic cross-linking polymer. In this case, we typically work in my lab with thyroid modified uh, polymers. And then if you put an enzyme in a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, it will form a nice network. If you would do that in a chip and you would make a very tiny droplet, what would actually happen is that your cell is automatically and directly located at the site of these droplets. That means at the moment you start miniaturizing the droplet formation, you can no longer center your cell without extra tricks. Now, this also matters because at the moment you have a cell within your microgel, at the moment you start culturing it, it directly pops out. And this in cell egression is a very, very efficient process. So at the moment you start to put this in culture, then within a few days, most of your cells are either escaped or escaping. So that's really not stable. So we spent about one and a half years trying to figure out how to do this. And then eventually we were sitting in a restaurant and then we were figuring out that this problem had already been solved. We were using all sorts of smart, smart engineering and chemical tricks to try to do it. Usually they work to some degree, but they were too complicated. And then we realized that if you go back to the food industry, we already center these kind of uh, aqueous solutions. For example, how to center a yolk inside of an egg, which is by very simple stirring. The local density is, uh, is higher in the yolk than in the egg white. So if you create a vortex, put your egg in, then you also have this cell or this yolk in this case in the center of your egg. So in, we engineered a chip in order to uh, achieve this. So in this case, we had an emulsification chip as I just showed you, but now we coupled it with a delayed gelation chip. So here we only make an aqueous droplet with a cell in an oil phase, and then later on we go going to crosslink it. Now, how this works is that here's our emulsion coming on. Then we have a, uh, a hydrogen peroxide feed. It goes via the side channels. Hydrogen peroxide actively goes through the PDMS quite efficiently. It can go into an oil phase, and then it diffuses into your uh, polymer phase in a quite controlled manner. 
So we use this trick, um, which they already had developed for sensing technology, but now for droplet chelation. What we now can do is we can start cross-linking it directly after droplet formation, like 10 milliseconds, or we can control it up until half a minute after droplet formation. And indeed, just like the egg, we could now center these kind of single cell microgels. And indeed, it's perfectly centered in all dimensions. And this is not a pretty representative entity. All our microgels look like that. And indeed, once we start culturing it, you can see that all these cells, they actually stayed within the microgel. It's stable. Now, if you compare our non-centered gels, we were also noticing that after about a week, 30% of these cells went out. Competing labs were reporting that they already had 70 to 80% of their cells being out of their gels within one or two days. So we also knew that our material, this Tyrement cross-linked material, had something that prevented this cell to actually egress. So we then started looking into whether the polymer had a unknown interaction with the cell. How we did this, or what our reasoning was for this, is that a tyramine is basically a, uh, it's an analog of a amino acid known as a tyrosine. So if you would look at the chemistry behind this, if you have these hydroxyl group, which will form an O-link or an OH uh, COC uh, link here, then you would be able to expect that if the tyramine can bind to itself, it should also bind to the uh, amino acid that's present in cells. So we ran a MOS spec, and indeed we would see that this peak is for the tyramine tyramine bonds. That's the most effective bond, but also if you look here, tyramine tyrosine bonds occur very efficiently. So we wanted to check if that's also happening on the outside of the cell. So if we just add a tyramineated fluorophore plus the enzyme, but not the oxidizer, the hydrogen peroxide, nothing happens. But if we add the oxidizer and are allowing the enzymatic reaction to occur, we very efficiently are, have now a method to fluorescently label a cell. Um, a focal analysis then showed that this, uh, if we look at the nucleus, the cytoskeleton, and where the tyramines are bonded, you can see already that it's slightly outside of where the cytoskeleton is. Specifically, if you look even further, it's right outside of the lipid membrane, which means that indeed we are just coating something on the outside of the cell with our tyramine bonds. So we're not binding something in the cell, we're directly tethering something on the cell. So what we're doing is we have a discrete reaction that we can now start performing on cellular uh, membranes. To see if that also reacts, uh, if we can have some uh, visual evidence that there is a cell membrane interaction with the material, we uh, co-developed a new method for embedding a an, uh, an cell in a plastic epoxy in order to do a uh, focused ion beam cutting so we can look with a high resolution SEM inside of such a microgel. So what you're looking here is about five micron of uh, hydrogel with a cell with, for example, its nucleus. And what you can see is that the cell membranes, even though the cell is shrinking, it's really tethered to the polymer. And in fact, if you would zoom in further, you would see that it's really pooling really intensively and even trying to disrupt and break away pieces of that material. So the cell membrane is very tightly bound to the, uh, to the cell, which was quite surprising at the time. The reason why this is useful is that means now we have a method for which we can react in time a cell to a material. And when we cross-link the stop, uh, the material from reacting, then basically it's no longer reactive. It turns back to a simple inert material. We're using a dextrin, which has no binding site or cellular uh, interaction. And we're using tyramines, which also without uh, cross-linking has no reaction. So we were thinking that if we would then be able to uh, tether a cell to a material, this could also be a new cell material interaction, uh, one that is controlled in time. So we then created, uh, by degree of cross-linking, we created soft, medium, and stiff microgels. So you can see that if we would do, then do a differentiation into adipogenesis to create fat cells or osteogenesis to create bone cells, 
and we would stain it for fat, indeed, it starts to light up. And if you start staining for calcium in the osteogenesis, this will light up as well. So we can very efficiently have mechanosensing happening in complete non-degradable and otherwise non-adhesive materials. After cross-linking, this is an inert material. It's only the bonds formed during the cross-linking that allow for this. Now, if we would then look further, we can indeed also start to analyze it again with uh, FIPSAM. So you can see fat accumulation and uh, mineralization nodes. And we also develop methods to look at these kind of differentiations in a label-free manner. So we can do time-resolved uh, single cell uh, resolution analysis over time. What we use that for is then now we can start looking at the single cell resolution of the differentiation uh, following mechanical cues, for example, soft, median, and stiff microgels. Now, as you might not be surprised, if you have stiffer microgels, you would get more osteogenesis, while well, in very soft gel, osteogenesis does not occur. This is not surprising, but it validates it uh, that our system is working even in the absence of regular binding sites. Moreover, we can now very easily and uh, reproducibly measure this differentiation at a single cell level in three dimensions. We then lever our platform for temporal control to ask a little bit more interesting question than if stiffness matters to differentiation. And we started to ask the question, when would stiffness matter during differentiation? So we first validated that we could post-cure to get uh, a stiff material that was indistinguishable from the directly made stiff material. And this allowed us to create samples that were directly made soft, which we kept soft, or directly made materials that were stiff, or would make materials that were soft in the beginning and were made st stiff after day one, day three, and day seven. Now, there's a lot of variation experiments being done, and they all point exactly the same uh, direction, and that is, if you do not have the correct stiffness within the first three days, you do not get your osteogenesis. So osteogenesis doesn't matter as long as you don't have it in the first three days. If you don't have it in the first three days, osteogenesis cannot occur. That's interesting because if you start looking at the biomarkers which are predictive for osteogenesis, none of them are upregulated at day three. So we are also running uh, RNA-seq uh, transcriptional uh, fingerprinting analysis to see what the early uh, markers and this early transcription profile is, which distinguishes them. And basically what we see is you have several uh, transcription factors that are upregulated that guide this, but also we see evidence for metabolic programming in here. We also still wanted to know how does this actually work? Because it, this is not like RGD, we investigated also uh, conventional pathways like yep test. They, those are all inactive in this system. So these traditional methods of uh, mechanotransduction simply do not occur in our system. It's a different way of um, stimulating a cell mechanically. So what we then did to try, try to figure this out is we took a tyramin that we modified with a biotin. We reacted that to the cell, shredded the cell, pulled down the biotin with everything attached to the tyramin, what was uh, crosslink to the cell, and did a mass spec analysis. So we know exactly what bound to the tyramin. And then we overlapped it with uh, a meta atisome that we created from several papers. And then we asked the question, which of the molecules able to create and signal mechanotransduction did we pull down? Now, Mostly what we see is that we are doing an indirect bond with, for example, fiber, nectin, and collagen. More specifically, we do this via alpha-V beta-1 and alpha-V5 beta-1 via the bond with fiber, nectin. Now, that makes sense. Not only did we pull down an incredible amount of fiber, nectin, but fiber, nectin also has the highest amount of tyrosine residue within its uh, molecular makeup. So that makes sense. If you then start to look at the axis over which it uh, operates, then you can see that from this whole uh, alpha V beta one network, we actually are able to have an 88% match, which means that 88% of all these proteins have been pulled out. So we're pretty sure that um, uh, this method, which we call uh, discrete on cell crosslinking, docking, operates via alpha V beta one. So this means the mechanical aspects, we have now a 
very interesting grasp on. But in the beginning of this talk, I already said that we also were interesting, interested in the chemical modification of these pericellular matrices. Matrices. So for that, we started to develop a modification of this polymer. So again, you have a dextrom uh, backbone with our retirement modification. And in this case, what we added here is a biotin linker. Now, the reason why we chose for biotin is biotin can have a uh, multivalent complexation with an evidence. Most of you will be very intimately familiar with this because this is also the basis for, for example, an ELISA assay. And the reason why that is, is that biotin evidence is the, one of the strongest known non-covalent bonds known to man. But what is less known is that there's a whole library of less specific or no, highly specific, less affinity, uh, less potent binders to the evidence. So for example, destiobiotin binds to evidence with an order of magnitude less energy. So we reasoned that if we would first bind this complexation with a destiobiotin, which we can modify with, for example, a scavenging antibody, in this case, it's a nanobody that captures growth factors, then basically we can use that to bind anything specifically, for example, the growth factor, in this case, a BMP, BMP7. And then if we would then add the biotin, since this is a non-covalent supramolecular bond, if we would then add a stronger bond, we would actually get supramolecular displacement. And this is what happens. So if we would do an SPRI analysis, we would in indeed see this accumulated bond, 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 and release. So that means that we can now not only start to modify our materials, but we also gain temporal control over the material. This allows for, if you have, for example, a microgel, once again, we can add a destiobiotinylated um, with, for example, a fluorophore conjugated to it, for very efficiently in a couple of seconds, we can fully uh, modify our materials. If we then at some point would add a biotin with a red fluorophore, then we can fully displace uh, or near fully displace the uh, destiobiotin biotin with the green fluorophore with the red fluorophore. Now, in this case, we used only two um, biotin and biotin analogs, but there's a whole library of 17 different ones where you can do sequential steps. We use this to demonstrate the functionality. So for example, it's a, it's a polymer backbone with a biotin and the everton. If you would have a cell in its presence, for example, it's encapsulated in the microgel, you would measure, uh, and this is a reporter cell line sensitive for BMP7. In the absence of all of that, the signal is low, it's off. If you would then add BMP7 to it, we can very nicely measure that the cell is responding. If we then add a destiobiotinylating with a neutralizing uh, uh, nanobody, we can see that although we add really high amounts of BMP, the cell is blinded for its environment, which means we can specifically remove uh, individual uh, cytokines or growth factors or any type of molecule uh, from a complex liquid and basically effectively blinding a cell uh, from uh, experiencing it. If we would then choose to bring this back, we can simply add a biotin to uh, supramolecularly displaced desti biotin, and then all of the summon, the cell will start sensing the environment once again, and also we can switch it off, et cetera, et cetera. So I've told you so far something about cells, microfluidics, creating pericellular matrices, but I haven't shown you examples that we still can then make actually tissues out of that. So something that we do quite a lot in our lab is that we then use this single cell microgel. We match it with a macromolecular precursor, so a secondary polymer. We mix it in and then basically we crosslink it. The interesting perspective here is that the full environment that is experienced by the cell is dictated by the primary polymer, while your additive manufacturing or your biofabrication is solely dependent or mostly solely dependent on your secondary polymer, which means that effectively using such a modular design for a bioing, we can now uncouple the micro and the macro environment. We published quite a lot on different applications, so we can do this with, for example, complex emulsions for photolithography. We can do double emulsifications to create reactive elements. This is not only important for cells, but also for sequential chemical reactions that cannot occur within the same physical space. We demonstrated that you can use it for injection molding to, for example, create tiny bones or cartilage. 
You can do this for 3D bioprinting, for hydrodynamic spinning and weaving. This is all possible. So if you can imagine that you put a cell in a polymer, you can also use a modular ink to advance it in that way. Which means now we have a very interesting platform to make a implant because everything I showed you so far has been in vitro. Always when we talk about this, we say, well, it's aimed for humans, we work with in vitro, and then we'll do animal testing. But in reality, this is the true skill that we work on. It's minuscule, it's tiny, and we also use typically small animals. It's very far away from uh, human translation. So if we want to bring the technology that I just showed to a clinical status, we need to upskill our production. And in order to do so, we must overcome a very simple but challenging problem. And that is that if we implant anything relatively small, so up until the millimeter scale, we've done it, other groups have done it for decades as well, these implants can survive. They will vascularize and they will perform. But if you go for a human clinically sized implant, you would still have the same angiogenic or vasculogenic rate, but it cannot transverse the distance in order to reach all the way through. So you can't get full thickness vascularization, which means that the most of your uh, implants will actually undergo lim nutrient limitation uh, due to diffusion limits, and then will actually undergo necrosis, which will lead to a total implant failure. So although we're very good at small implants, we're really bad at making big implants within the field. So this is something that we also wanted to address. So we developed a couple of these techniques. For example, a modular design where we take a hydrogel in which we uh, reason that we can improve the diffusive properties of a material using modular designs. For example, we can create a tissue in which we create a very well uh, diffusive element. The interesting uh, difference with, uh, for example, printed vessels is that this is absolutely monolithic. This is a solid piece, um, which, for example, for cartilage is very important. Now, what we then did is we did an embedded bioprinting strategy where we can uh, then print these lines in. We can also do it as uh, in singular, but we all can also make connections. So there's actually three dimensional diffusion going on in there. And that this works. Can we can demonstrate here. So this is a material uh, uh, in which we've printed these lines. In this case, of uh, it's a pec DMA alginate buff. So the bulk is pec DMA alginate, and we printed uh, fib, uh, fibrinogen uh, in here, and then we cross-linked it uh, with having the enzyme inside of the pec DMA alginate bath. Now, if we then soak it simply in a BSA fit C solution, you can directly see it really diffuses in super fast. And it really goes over that. So what we're uh, constructing here is highways of diffusion, which means that through the fibrin, if you need to cross long distances, nutrients and soluble factors like growth factors, um, they can very easily go over these highways. And then the short distances towards the back uh, alginate, they can travel, but not the long if they would not be vascularized. The second advantage of this modular design is that we can start emulating these natural properties that I introduced in the beginning of my presentation. For example, you can have this cell in pericellular matrix in the heart extracellular matrix for cartilage. Now we can have an extra, ex, uh, abstract emulation of this. So we can have a soft gel in a strong gel that we can print. Now what we demonstrated here is that if you do so, you can have megapascal stiff gels still having very large domains of very soft fibrin gels within. So that means if you put your cells in this fibrin, your cells will experience this as kilopascal soft, as do your chondrocytes in your native tissue. But if you would do a, at the tissue scale, a mechanical analysis, this is really a uh, megapascal stiff. So we have again uncoupled what is happening on the micro from what's happening on the macro scale. And then subsequently, we demonstrate that that is very advantageous for uh, cartilage formation as well. Not only is it in the right stiffness, it also is able to access its nutrients. And that works till a certain size. You can also imagine if you would like to upskill this further, diffusion and diffusion limits will only go as far as that limit will allow it. 
which means that we also realize that if you want to make really big implants, diffusion is simply not going to cut it. So if the host cannot provide the nutrients for the implant, we also realize that the implant should provide the nutrients for itself. And in this case specifically, we've been interested in generating oxygen within living tissues. So what we've been doing uh, in collaboration also uh, with uh, Ali Kamuzani and uh, Surin Shin is we have incorporated calcium peroxides inside of hydrogels and then demonstrated that indeed, if you then place these living uh, biomaterials inside of a anoxic environment, that means that the uh, oxygen concentration is below half a percent. Normally, cells would readily die. If you add your calcium peroxide, you can scavenge that. Now, from this analysis, blue is healthy, green is apoptotic, red is uh, necrotic, as semi-quantified here. You can already see that we do deal with the necrosis, but we absolutely do not deal properly with the apoptosis. And that is because the calcium, uh, uh, calcium peroxide in the presence of water not only generates oxygen, but it does so via the intermediary product of hydrogen peroxide. Now that induces cell death by itself. So now we're basically trading one third of cell death for another. In order to pace that, uh, and to control not to get uh, cytotoxic levels of hydrogen peroxide buildup, we are starting to put this calcium peroxide in hydrophobic micromaterials. So in this case, it's inside of a micromaterial. This is about five microns in diameter. And at the moment that you would uh, then put it in, the, uh, in an aqueous environment, the hydrophobicity of the polymer, in this case, uh, polycaprolactone, would allow only a fraction of the water to penetrate and therefore only a fraction of the hydrolysis to occur, which means that you get longer release, but also milder release. And indeed, we demonstrate that we can have, um, if you look at the hydrogen peroxide levels of unencapsulated materials, it's really high. Everything above 20 millimotor is toxic. So if you just use calcium peroxide, it's directly toxic for up to two to three days. But if you do the encapsulation in these micromaterials, it's stable for at least 12 days below the toxic uh, level. Indeed, if you then also still look at the oxygen generation, in the first one to two, three days, you can measure oxygen release, um, but then it stops. If you encapsulate it in the hydrophobic uh, micromaterial, you can get easily release up until 12 days. Now, as said, calcium peroxide is toxic. Hydrogen peroxide in different concentrations, even up until 10% Hox volume volume with 30% calcium peroxide per uh, Hox microparticle, we can uh, keep cell survival. And then we were asking, what does that do to your cells? Because eventually this will run out. The calcium peroxide after 14, 15 days is also done reacting. So that means that we need to stimulate the body to take over this nutrient uh, uh, provision role. So we need to have vascularization happening. Now, what you would typically see in literature is that they say that the less oxygen you have, the more production of angiogenic growth factors such as VEGF you will get. And this is absolutely correct. Now, if we have anoxia plus our hydrophobic particles, you see that it's still very high, but a little bit less. And that's because we raise the oxygen tension by about 1%. What's very important is that Normally, the VEGF is very, production is very stable, but not so in anoxia. Over time, it strongly decreases. And the reason why is anoxia will kill your cells. And it might not surprise you that a dead cell does not uh, secrete high amounts of VEGF anymore. Interestingly, if you combine this with the hydrophobic oxygen generators, it doesn't actually go down, it goes up in time, which means that although we have a very severe hypoxia, there is enough oxygen to make sure that the cell doesn't die and still produces VEGF. And indeed, if we would then implant this, in this case, in a small animal model, we implanted a gelma construct containing nothing, meaning it had HMSCs in there, but not uh, this, uh, the oxygen generating microparticles, or we did exactly the same, but with 2% volume of our uh, hydrophobic oxygen generator microparticles, you can directly see the difference. This is basically a necrotic tissue. Well, if you explant this after a week, we see already very nice vascularization going through our implant. If you would then look with live dead stating, then basically this is our implant. It's pretty much gone. Well, the host tissue is uh, pretty nice and alive. 
If you then look at the implant here, so this is the host tissue, this is the uh, engineer tissue, you can directly see how many of these vessels start to grow in. What we then also see is because these cells are more lively, the degradation rate of our polymer from the gel mass very much changed. So the green is the hydrogel. If 1% hox, it's almost directly gone after seven days. So if 2%, it's completely gone. But instead, you see here already matrix formation and uh, elements that uh, are uh, hollow and filled with what appears to be red blood cells. And indeed, if we stain for CD31, the, these uh, vessels are aligned with uh, endothelial uh, CD31 positive cells, at least. Moreover, if these were human MSCs, if we then stain for human nuclear antigen, we would not see any cell living in our material uh, almost in our controls. These, most of these cells are dead, except maybe a little bit in the boundary here we have the interface with the host. If you would then go uh, to the 2%, then you can see if you screen, screen very nicely because magenta and light brown are not the easiest to distinguish, but you see that there is a lot of magenta cells here, which means that we actually are able in an immunocompetent mice to still have quite some human cells there, which we thought was also surprising. If we would then like to upscale this further, we're still limited by the vasculogenic or the angiogenic speed by which we can form this. And that is rate limited by biology, which means that if you really want to go large, we would still need a different technology. Um, we can only bridge so far till 12 days. For these smaller implants, we can see seven days, we can have very nice um, uh, vascularization occurring. But if we would go to multiple, multiple centimeters for human implants, we also know that it's simply the physics is not there and the biology does not comply. So then we realized that if we could not have the host again provide such uh, what we would need, then we would again need to have the implant be engineered via integration of a modularity design to have it already present. Now, what do I mean with that? In this case, we can have micromaterials, living micro building blocks, for example, cellate and microgels that we can glue together. Now, if you do that, and you would effectively create a micro annealed particle or hydrogel, so a MAP hydrogel, then you, what you will create is an open porous microstructure that resembles a capillary, uh, capillary bed. Now, how do we create such a thing? We use a advanced droplet generation technique where we do a first crosslink to get a cell laden hydrogel, and we use a secondary crosslink in order to get our uh, maps produced. So we use inner microfluidics to get the throughput. In a couple of slides, I'll explain you a little bit more. Suffice it to say, this is a really exceedingly fast technique with excellent monad dispersity. So if you would then create such a map with, and now we're looking at a nano CT image, which was created by a collaborator um, in uh, University of Oslo, Harvard Haugen. Then basically you can indeed see if we glue or covalently bond these microgels together, you can already see these openings and these are all the way through. So these have very nice internal structures. And if you would then look with a, for example, confocal microscope at a section through here, and if we would perfuse it, and this is a few seconds after we start uh, perfusing this element, every microgel around it is perfusible, which means that this really starts to resemble a capillary bed structure. If we then leave this run for a couple of minutes and then we take an average intensity, you would see that all these uh, capillaries now are uh, perfused. The advantage of that is, um, unrelated towards its size that we engineer, we can now start perfusing throughout the entire bulk, but also the maximal diffusion limit, because these microgels are about 100 micrometers, that means that the maximal diffusion limit is about 50 micrometers. So what you're looking at here is real time, the diffusion of a fluorophore, which you can see that it very easily diffuses inside of these microgels, but it also diffuses very fast out. So the interaction with these capillaries between the implant and the host is exceedingly fast and not related to the implant size. So now we have a couple of technologies that we can indeed go from, have a connection from small to big and then assume that we can engineer something that would survive, which would make that the, we can make these elements survive, but we, we still need to produce them. Technically, 
the speeds that we and the entire field work on are very slow, so like one microliter per minute. Uh, but if you want to create such a big scale, you really have to work at orders of magnitude higher, like the millimeter scale. So a couple of different approaches we've taken. For example, we've uh, used stereo lithography to create three types of upscalable multi-nozzle uh, production entities. For example, you can have a plug and play and predetermined uh, array where you can uh, connect many different uh, units together, or you can stack them with a flow divider, or you can have a radial design where you have many, many, many different chips all together. Also, we can start using in-air microfluidics to uh, produce the per or increase the per nozzle throughput. So how does this work? In this case, we have a piezo-activated jet that collides on top of a constant stream. So in this case, you have your uh, uh, aqueous phase with cells in here that we collide with a polymer jet due to surface tension and you get Marigoni driven encapsulation. So you get a very nice encapsulation over here. And to, uh, then we can solidify it, for example, using a third jet or inside of the second jet. In this case, we use the, second, uh, the third jet to crosslink again. And the reason why is now we can make super thin capsules. We can also make solid entities, but uh, we already published that before in our department. So now we focused on really nice micro, 100 micrometer sized hollow capsule. So in this case, we produce about 100 times faster. So if you compare it to normal microfluidics we're in here, which is not even off the uh, y-axis. So this is like um, 0.001 and 0.1 of milliliter per minute, while we are at six milliliter per minute. So we can now produce with the same quality, but 100 times faster. Now, what did we use that for? Um, we can, for example, not use just these beads for the engineering that I just discussed, that we use the building blocks to build something bigger. We also realized that we can build something inside of these hollow materials. So for example, we can put uh, pluripotent stem cells like embryonic stem cells or IPSCs. In this case, an example of uh, embryonic stem cells. And then basically we can have a restriction in here where you can get a self-assembly. And then we basically created luminogenic organoids. So basically if you put your cells in here, you would see that first you, you get some proliferation and automatically you get a very nice controlled lumen. Now we're still working on why that actually occurs, but it is exceedingly efficient and this cannot be generated using conventional structures. So if you would then look, it's not due to cell death, it's really a nice delineation. If you would look at the polarization of, for example, nucleus, you can see really nice polarization inside of the structure and still these cells are completely pluripotent if you would, for example, stay in for pluripotency markers. We then realize if we can create such a luminogenic uh, construct, we can also start making uh, a differentiation in towards actually a micro tissue. Since we have a cavity inside, why not go for a miniature heart? So a uh, hollow micro uh, material, a micro tissue with a, uh, uh, with a micro cavity in there, like in a resembling a chamber. We used a genetically modified reporter cell line from the lab and in collaboration with Robert Garcia from the University of Twente, where you, we can see here like early commitment toward the, the uh, earlier cardiac lineage and towards the later cardiac lineage. And indeed, if you would then look at alpha actin in staining, we can very nicely now create miniature hearts within these uh, micro materials. And indeed, these have very nice contractility and we're also mapping how strong they can be. For the last slide, and then I uh, am done with the examples what we are doing in the lab. We cannot only generate these type of organoids, we can also protect them. So for example, for diabetes type one, we can create organoids. And then if you would implant these back into patients, then since it's an autoimmune disease, we need to protect it. And so in this case, we do exactly the same as I showed you before, but now we are putting an immunoprotective material around it. So it's a hollow core with an organoid and then a immunoprotective shell around it. We did this by using an eight arm pack, Again, with FIPSM, we can demonstrate that this is indeed a hollow micromaterial. If you then uh, use these kind of diffusion assays, we show that it's indeed immunoprotective. Antibodies cannot go in. If you then look at the function, we can indeed show that if you stimulate these kind of uh, engineered uh, isolates, we would be able to um, have at least performance for 28 days. Uh, they kept on performing quite nicely. So what you do is, you give low sugar, high sugar, low sugar, and then you measure the amount of insulin being produced, which is the primary function of these isolates. When we implanted this into mice, 
then we can indeed see if you would implant these uh, engineered microconstructs without the coating, you would not get the rescue. So we're here we're looking at blood glucose level. We induce them to become diabetes. And if we implant a non-encapsulated uh, cell implant, nothing happens. And that's because these cells are attacked by the immune system and die. But now if we include these kind of engineered uh, isolates, then very nicely these cells become normal glycemic and stable. With that, I've uh, explained you uh, quite a lot about the efforts that we're doing on microfluidics and microgels. I've uh, expanded some about our work on advanced bioinks and a little bit about the work we're doing on microorganoids. I've topicked uh, at least some of the efforts that we're doing on metabolism sustaining uh, materials and micromaterials. Um, it's worth to note that we also do quite a lot of bioprinting and organism chips and cellular nano coatings in our lab. If you're interested in that, do contact me because it's not in this presentation to a significant degree. With that, I would like to thank all the funders uh, and the people who work actually, uh, who actually do the work. I'm very fortunate to have an amazing team. From the data that you've seen today, most of the work has been generated by Tom Kamperman, who's currently a postdoc in my lab, as well as by uh, Bas van Loo, uh, Mike Schot, and uh, several others. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and give the word back to Mehmet. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. I think it was uh, super clear. Several questions came in. Uh, one of them is, what type of gel are you using? Uh, so we, we are using a host of different gels. In, my lab is a little bit agnostic towards which type of gels we're using. Um, we're using anything from hyaluronic acid to collagens to gelatins to chitosan to alginates to <laughs> um, polyethylene glycols to uh, you name it. Um, we, we typically try to match it with the application that we have. Um, one of the workhorse uh, strategies that we have in the lab is the time and chemistry, because we know quite well how this works. Um, and we have a, a, a very large toolbox that we can work with. But we also work with ionic cross-linking, with clicket chemistry, with uh, photo-initiating uh, systems. So it, it really truly depends on what material system we're working with. Uh, with ad application, we are desiring to determine which uh, material system we work with. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this answer. Um, can you make these micro gels uh, bigger, like four times? Yeah, we can make them in any size. So the, the trick is to make them smaller. Um, making them big is easy. Making them small is hard. Uh, so if you would like to, for example, we have them 100. And, uh, we have now typically 30, 35 micrometers. That's rather tricky. So not a lot of labs in the world can do that. Uh, if you want to have a single cell in, let's say, a 100 or 150 micrometer uh, gel, that's relatively straightforward uh, because you don't have to get the perfect centering because the volume is big enough that the cell will be in there anyway. Um, you can go up to the millimetric scale if you would desire so, but we never see a true reason to do that. Okay, uh, another question is, uh, does the cardio scale with the size of the particles? So we can make them in different sizes. Um, we can also evolve them over time. I haven't showed you that data yet, um, but basically the ones that I showed you today is the diameter of the bead is about 200, 250 micrometers, which means that the organoids that you've been seeing or the cardioids as we term them, um, they are about, let's say, 150, and then the later stages are 200. Uh, we can make them bigger, so we can go in the multiple hundreds of micrometers if we would like to do so. Smaller would probably be challenging because then you might not have sufficient amount of cells for the cell organization. Thank you. Um, uh, what is the polymer that you use in your capsule? Uh, so so it's... <laughs> It goes back to the first question. So yeah. it's, um, it, it really depends on the application that we have. So we've designed several microfluidic techniques that are compatible with the different types of cross-linking. So typically we look more like what kind of stiffness or, uh, or, or cross-linking speed uh, 
uh, we would need. For example, if you talk about this on-chip microfluidics, we would like to have it cross-linked in, for example, one minute. If you work with the in-air microfluidics, we would like to cross-link it in like 0.1 second max. So you're more limited in the types of cross-link. Uh, as for the stiffness, well, that's just blending and concentration. So that's pretty easy. Yes. Uh, so you worked on vascularization. Have you uh, done any in vivo studies showing anastomosis or are you moving in that direction? Yeah, so, so for the... Um, um, for the oxygen generating uh, micromaterials, uh, those are in vivo data and those were fully vascularized. So we see that the, there's full blood in our samples. Uh, and the nice thing is it's full thickness uh, vascularized. So it, it's, and not only that, we also, if you analyze the type of blood vessels, they're larger and they're more complex. So you have more of a multi-layer type of endothelial. So you really see you also are already evolving the different types of blood vessels. So not just uh, a blood vessel, but we also have evidence for arterioles and uh, capillaries uh, in there. Um, for the other types of vascularization, yes, we are doing that. That's something we really want to do and are doing. Thank you, thank you. Um, you check VEGF secreted in normoxia, hypoxia, and then um, and then you have more VEGF secreted in hypoxia than you have normoxia. Could you explain these results? Yeah, so if you look at day zero, so if you just give it a few hours, you have it, the amount of VEGF produced is inversely correlated to anoxia. But if you culture it a bit longer, you your cells start simply dying under anoxia. So then basically you will, and that's also what happens in vivo, by the way. Um, at the moment your cells start dying, they stop producing VEGF as you can imagine. Now, one of the things that you very often read in papers is that you see like a very intense vascularization at the outside of your implants. And then people very often start to claim that, well, it's happening. So if we wait longer, you get full thickness vascularization, but also you see that the vascularization inside of the outside edge is actually more intense than at the tissue interface. Now, the funny thing that we are pretty convinced about, and we also see in our implantation experiments is what happens is, well, if, if you do not have oxygen generation or anything of that type that would sustain life, then your vessels would start to grow in your implant dies on the inside, which means that now your VEGF is no longer high in, the, uh, in your implant. It's actually higher in, your, uh, in the host. So you really see these vessels basically turning around and going back, which means now you have twice vascularization here, but nothing in the middle. So you get very nice thick vascularization at the edges, but not really in the middle. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's something that we really need to combat. Hence, we are working with these uh, oxygen generators. Thank you. Have you tried to use primary cells for the study? And did you check cell viability? Um, that depends which study, but uh, mostly- we Cell work. encapsulation probably. Yeah, so for virtually all our work we use uh, with uh, HMSCs or chondrocytes, that's the vast majority. Uh, if we work with endothelial cells, we both work with UVEX and primary, uh, like micro endothelial cells. Um, if for the, if we're talking about the diabetes work, for example, um, these are uh, min six cells, and we have also used primary beta cells isolated from PIC because that's one of the key sources that will uh, is expected to be the source for the cell source of the future for clinics uh, for the humanized PICs. But you still probably need some form of encapsulation for protection. Um, for the uh, cardioids, so we are using pluripotent stem cells. So they are, uh, by definition, if you use embryonic stem cells, uh, depending on your definition, but they are primary cells. And we are also doing this with iPS cell lines. Um, yes, they're cell lines, but they're still primary human cells in a certain perspective. Thank so you. the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Your cell labeling technique is interesting. Have you assessed the fate of labeled moieties on cells? Will they get shed with time? Is it dependent on the size of the label? Yeah, so, so we, we looked into this and we even tried to patent this, but uh, that failed horribly. Um, so um, we learned something along the way, and that is that we can very efficiently label these cells and it's a beautiful technique. It's completely cell-friendly. 
um, since you are not targeting the receptors, but you're targeting the, the matrix and the matrix is relatively stable, it's remodeled. Um, we've not done very, very, very long uh, experimentation, but I mean, uh, it's stable for days to weeks and then the stability is more dependent on your fluorophore. So it doesn't really get absorbed unless if you do it in very low concentrations on cells that don't produce matrix, because then you're mostly targeting uh, most likely cells on the cell membrane, because we do know that we also target these directly, for example, integrants. We are also targeting them directly. Then you get a more faint uh, stain, and then basically it is taken up within a few hours. Uh, so that we see. Um, the interesting thing why the patenting failed is that the, which we did not know, but you know that nowadays we have more intense uh, anti flu fluorescent antibodies. They do that exactly via this styrimination technique as well, but then they target the antibodies, which means you get a very stable bond with, uh, that makes it brighter. Now we do that, but then directly on the cells. Thank you, thank you. One final question. How many cells are inside your small micro gel and how about their viability? So we, we very nicely control this because it's predetermined by uh, uh, engineering factors. So uh, our single cell micro gels, it's obviously one cell per micro gel per definition. We can control the whether they proliferate or not. So we can very nicely determine if it becomes two or four and then stops or stays one. Um, we have some degree of control over that, I should say. Um, for the, if we load the hollow microparticles, if that was where the question went uh, towards, we can control that as well. Um, it's absolutely controlled by the pre-polymer solution uh, cell concentration. Uh, depending for which application we're now talking about, for the cardioids, we put something like 20 cells in and that's sufficient. We also put several hundred or like five cells and the answer is, it does the same just at a different speed because of you need to reach a certain threshold to get cell assembly. For the beta cells, we put as many cells as possible. So the pre-polymer solution then has up to 80 million cells per ml. And we can't really go above that because then your cells start to aggregate really badly inside of the polymer solution. And then the microfluidics basically becomes very, very challenging. Um, but then we can put hundreds of cells in these uh, uh, hollow micro materials. But on average, for these applications, we put like a hundred, fifty to hundred. Thank you, thank you. How did you separate organoids encapsulated and microcapsules from immiscible phase such as oil? Um, so, depending on what you need to do, you can use a very uh, imperfect. Uh, oil water emulsion. So for if at, at the moment you make, for example, these single cell microgels, you need a really, really high degree of control over the oil. So you need high end oils like uh, PicoSurf with, uh, with uh, fluorinated oils. Um, so that's really, you need to wash it and buy, use PicoBreak and then wash it, wash it, wash it, right? And then basically the, we put it on a aqueous solution and then they simply drop in. Um, for most of our work, we use a very imperfect uh, emulsification. So we just use hexadecane. It's really not that stable. And we just mix it with water and we dilute it a couple of times. So you start losing your surfactant a little bit. And then what you see is that it automatically drops into the water phase. We've done some analysis on how uh, dirty oil contaminated these samples are. It's, it's there, it's not that much. Uh, it is one of the reasons why we're doing the in-air microfluidics as well, because we have no oil phase there. The immiscible phase is air. So that's very easy to get rid of because it just stops in water and it's gone. Um, so if you want to start scaling this up, oil might become a problem. Um, however, there are clinically approved uh, oils that you are allowed to use without having problems for translation in that sense. So we have looked into that as well. They do work but they're typically a little bit more on the viscous side. So we don't like working with them, but there's no reason why you can't work with them. Awesome, well, thank you for the great talk. I appreciate your time. That's all I have, uh, Jeroen. Hey, thanks, Mehmet, it was a pleasure.